All right, hey guys, welcome to Through the Bible, Verse by Verse, a plain and simple study of the entire Bible, book by book, chapter by chapter, and verse by verse. We're currently in Deuteronomy chapter 25, coming up on the clothing hours of Moses' life here on earth and his uh, farewell address to the nation of Israel. All right, let's get into it. Deuteronomy chapter 25. Five. <clears throat> We've been talking about some, uh, of course, just again, general laws. He's re emphasizing, reiterating general laws. This, These were set, De Deuteronomy serves as a quick study in the law, quick reference, okay? And uh, he would keep a copy of this. The king was to keep a copy of this all the days of his life and read through it. And he could know, you know, the righteous standard that God has set for Israel. And I'm going to keep that in mind, too. Israel. All right, verse 1. If there is a dispute between men and, and they are to go to court and the judges will hear their cases, they will clear, they will clear the innocent and condemn the guilty. Now, this is something that... We see today where guilty people, because of their fame and their celebrityism, that, I mean, we're talking about the general crowd, root for them. And, th and this is a sin, by the way. This kind of shows the depravity on the rise. Think about this. You think about some of your heroes in cinema. Tony Soprano, for example. You know, he was an evil person, and yet... Uh, he was a hero. And I mean, and, and many figures could go on like that. In real life, John Gotti, right, was an evil person. And because he wore, he was called the Dapper Don, because he wore nice suits and stuff, the masses rooted for him. So it kind of shows you the depravity of man. So, God set forth righteous judgments. A justice, a fair system. And one is not to clear the innocent or to condemn the guilty. Our, our system, our system of government right now is just so uh, evil in this respect. You think about all, there are innocent people right now in, in jail. And even when it is proven, even when it is proven that they did not, that they did not uh, commit the crime, Sometimes it takes months, years for them to get out of jail. It's, this is the kind of evilness that, again, and one reason why, let me just say this, because not so much is the law itself, but evil men. All right. Verse 2. If the guilty party deserves to be flogged, the judge will make him lie down and be flogged in the presence with the number of lashes appropriate for him. He may be flogged with 40 lashes, but no more. Otherwise, if he is flogged, with more than 40 lashes than these, your brothers will be degraded in your sight. Okay. Um, um, when you think about Jesus flogging, he was flogged by Romans, not by, um, not by the Jews. Jesus flogging had, they can lay as many stripes on him as they want. And plus, he was whipped with what was known as a canine tail. So it actually had three whips in it embedded with bones and metal so that they would lacerate your back so to think about it if you hit him one time you was actually hitting him three times okay uh, the jews were very careful that they would actually sometimes only give 39 but to make sure that they wouldn't go past 40 lashes okay uh, verse four um but notice he also says that the lashes were to be appropriate for the crime not in other words the carrying out of justice was always to be fair and righteous okay fair and righteous verse 4 do not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain greedy men again would put a muzzle over the ox so that they wouldn't eat the corn or eat whatever so remember, the law was given to an unrighteous man. You had to have the only reason why you have a law is not for righteous people, but for unrighteous people. 
and, and so greed right here is God is like God is looking out for the ox here and said, hey, he's trading, he's he's threshing, carrying out your burdens that would make your life more hard if you had to do it by yourself. Don't mother put a muzzle over his ox. All right, verse five. When brothers live on the same property and one of them dies without a son, the wife of the dead man may not marry a stranger outside the family. Her brother-in-law is to take her as his wife, have sexual relations with her, and perform the duty of the brother-in-law. Now, this is a very strange practice that was incorporated into the law. We saw this back when Judah, um, the reason why you have Tamar, um, his sons. Um, so this practice, I don't know where this practice came up with. It is now, as we say, incorporating the law, very strange. So that if you have, let's say, five brothers, and then one of the brothers died, but he didn't have a child yet, then the, the older brother, and it's to kind of go down the list, but the older brother or another brother would take the wife, have sexual relationship, get her pregnant, and then that would carry on the brother's seed. Okay? Now, it, it, to me, it's strange, but this was something that was incorporated in the law here. Very interesting. Uh, verse 6 says, The first son she bears will carry on the name of the dead brother, so his name will not be blotted out from Israel. So it was called like, you know, you know, if we, and, and if we think about it now with the DNA, you could kind of say, well, you're close because you got the same DNA, but the idea was the genealogy here. Verse 7, but if the man doesn't want to marry his sister-in-law, she must go to the elders at the gate and say, my brother-in-law refuses to preserve his brother's name in Israel. He isn't willing to perform the duty of the brother-in-law. The elders of the city will summon him and speak to him. If he persists and says, I do not want to marry her, then the sister-in-law will go up, go up to him in the sight of the elders, remove his sandal from his foot and spit in his face. Then when she... Then she will declare, this is what is done to the man who would not build up his brother's house. And his family name is, is and his family name in Israel will be called the house of the man whose sandal was removed. Um, some people just didn't want to do it. You know, they wanted their firstborn. Maybe the, it was the situation where he hasn't had children yet and he wanted his firstborn to carry his name. Um, so, you know, again, to me, one of these strange laws. That if two men are fighting with each other and the wife of one steps in to rescue her husband uh, from the one striking him and he puts and she puts out her hand and grabs his genitals, you are to cut off her hands, you must not show pity. Now, we do know that domestic uh, domestic fights could be one of the most dangerous, especially for police. And this happens all the time. In fact, the man could be beating up the woman and, and then the other man steps in to rescue her, and he starts beating up her husband. She'll jump him. Anyway, he says, cut her hand off. All right. Uh, verse 13, you must not have two different weights in your bag, a heavy and a light one. You must not have do, two different, uh, you, uh, you must not have two different dry measures in your house, large and smaller. You must have a full, honest weight. A full and honest dry measure so that you may live long in the land. <clears throat> the Lord your God has given you for everyone who does such things and acts unfairly is detestable to the Lord your God. In other words, fair justice. If, if you want to kind of, kind of get an ideal of that, you ever wonder if the, uh, the meter is set on your gas pumps when you gas up? So that, 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 that would be a good example of that. Um, another way is, are you know, you're getting really 100% gas. But that's another, you know, that this is a good example. In other words, fair measurements is what he's saying right here. Remember what the Amalekites did to you on the journey after you left Egypt. They met you along the way and attacked all of your stragglers from behind when you were tired and weary. They did not fear the Lord. And when the Lord your God gives you rest from all your enemies around you in the land, the Lord your God has given you to possess, 
add the inheritance, blot out the memory of Amalek under heaven. Don't forget it. Kind of interesting because some of the people will forget it, but God is saying, take out vengeance for them. Okay, um, chapter 26. Um, very interesting. This is um, one on tithing. Kind of interesting one on tithing. I'll tell you about it when we get into it. But there are some of the Word of Faith people, the prosperity movement, kind of actually use this to try to take and receive tithe. Verse 1. When you enter the land, excuse me, when you enter the land the Lord your God has given you as an inheritance, and you take possession of it and live in it, you must take some of the first of all of the land's produce that you harvest from the land Yahweh your God has given you to put put it in the container. Then you need to go to the place where Lord your God chooses to have his name dwell. And when you go before the priest who was serving at the time, you must say to him, Today I acknowledge to you, to the Lord your God, that I have entered the land uh, the Lord swore to our fathers to give us. The priest <clears throat> will take the container from your hand, place it before the altar, in the, in the Lord your God. And you are to respond by saying in the presence of the Lord your God, <clears throat> My father, by the wandering Aramean, Aramean, he went down to Egypt with the few people and lived there. And there he became a great and powerful and populous nation. But the Egyptians mistreated and afflicted us and forced us into hard labor. So we call out to Yahweh uh, to... Uh, we, sorry, we called out to Yahweh, the God of our fathers. And the Lord heard our cry and saw our misery, hardships, and oppression. But the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a strong hand and an outstretched arm, with a terrifying power, with signs and wonders. And he led us to this place, and he gave us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. I have now brought the first of the land the produce to you, Lord, uh, to you, Lord, have given, you have given me. You will, place, you will place the container before the Lord your God and bow to him. You, the Levite, the foreigner, residents among you, will rejoice in all the good things the Lord has given, the Lord your God has given you in your household. Now, the reason why I, uh, I kind of just going to just briefly mention this is because a number of years ago, when the Word of Faith people were teaching their prosperity and their faith, every so often... You know, they had to kind of answer the question, how come the people wasn't giving their money? One of the ways that they kind of came up with was that there were, you had to give certain offerings a certain kind of way. And uh, so tithing, of course, was one. Um, giving to the poor, giving to the ministry, being a giver. And they promised you you would have wealth untold like them. Well, nobody received it. And so after time, from time to time, they would have to kind of like address it. And one of the ways they were dressed is they were sort of making up stuff. I mean, like one time they would say, like, well, you got to send your angels out. Come on, guys, you're not doing that? And then one of the things that they kind of addressed with this verse. In other words, wait a minute. When you guys give your tithe, are you following Deuteronomy 26 here? And so then people crafted a prayer, not like this because they're not Israel, but they crafted a prayer like this because they said, this is why you're not receiving your tithe blessing. And so people started doing uh, that. They would get a basket, they would get their offerings, and they would do the crafted prayer like that. Um, later on, another guy came out and go, God told me why y'all not getting your all's prosperity blessing. You gotta put you gotta name your seed. So but that's you know, so those of you all who know, if you're under the word of faith movement, that's what they do. Okay. But this was just again a prayer for Israel. Okay. A prayer for Israel to do. When they enter into the land, and that, and that God would bless them, and especially too, they would take this offering to the place of worship. All right, verse 12. When you have finished paying all of the tenth of your produce in the third year, the year of the tenth, you are to give it to the Levite, foreigner, fatherless, and the widow, so that they may eat in your town to be satisfied then you will say in the presence of the Lord your God interesting that the word of faith people never quoted this half of the verse 
but I do digress. All right. I have taken, <laughs> it says, I've taken the consecrated portions out of my house, and I've also given it to the Levite, to the foreigners, to the fatherless, to the widows, according to all the commands that you gave me. I have not violated or forgotten your commands. I have not eaten any of it while in mourning, or removed any of it while unclean, or offered any of it to the, for the dead. I have obeyed the Lord my God, and I have done all you, you commanded me. Look down from your holy dwelling from heaven and bless your people Israel in the land you have given them as, as you sworn to your fathers, a land flowing with milk and honey. So they, they copied this, you know, they would copy this, as I said, and pray, and they, you know, so. All right, uh, verse 16. It says, this is, this, you see, the Lord your God is commanding you this day to follow these statutes and ordinance. You must be careful to follow them with all of your heart and all of your soul. Today, you have affirmed that the Lord is your God and that you would walk in his ways and keep his statutes, commands, and ordinances and obey him. And today, the Lord has affirmed you, affirmed that you are his special people as he promised and that you keep all of his commands and that he will elevate you to praise, uh, elevate you to praise, fame, and glory above all the nations. And he has made, uh, he has made, he has made, and that you will be a holy people to the Lord your God as he promised. Now, one of the ways that we kind of have to take this, um, again, remember the law was only given because of transgressions until the seed would come. The law of Moses was never intended to give life, eternal life. It only brought out the fact that you were a sinner. Now, I'm saying this because this kind of is, is the close of, this is sort of the close of, um, um, uh, of, of the commanding part, of giving the commands, okay? And then so when we get into chapters 28, he's going to give you the, 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 the blessings and the cursings. We're getting that next time. Um, but even with this, now keep this in mind, Israel would never keep this, keep these commands. And, and, and not because God is not merciful, but because man was sinful. Um, that they would continually fall into pagan practices, pagan worship. Um, the idea if of the, of the law of Moses is this. It taught us that if you think you can be righteous before God by keeping these commands, you will find that you cannot. The conclusions should be, Lord, what can we do? And of course, it leads us to Christ. It leads us to uh, Jesus and what his atoning sacrifice on the cross would do. You also should keep this in mind that if you're going to say, I'm going to be righteous by living, and I'm going to say this, let me use this, this phrase, holiness or living right, doing good deeds, that you have to keep all of this law all the time perfectly. If you keep 99.9.9.9% of the law and violate it in the point zero 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 one, you have broken the entire law. You cannot keep the law and be righteous before God. Okay. All right, guys, chapter 27 in the next study. I'll see you then.